Introduction to chemical reactions. We're going over most of the important stuff you need to know to be able to write a balanced chemical equation. So first off, we need to know whether a reaction is happening. So there are some indicators that would let you know if a chemical reaction is taking place. And these are, again, indicators. So these may indicate that a reaction is occurring. If you see a color change, could be a reaction. If there's a gas produced, and that can be seen sometimes as uh, uh, bubbles being released if it's in solution or maybe a uh, gas given off, um, that could be a reaction. Energy released or absorbed, so it's giving off heat or it is taking in heat, it's cooling down, also an indicator. Um, and if you mix two solutions together and you get a solid precipitate, like it goes all cloudy and if you let it, it'll settle, settle down to the bottom um, or crystals start growing, um, that could be another indicator of a reaction itself. But again, these are all indicators of it. Um, you could have physical changes with a lot of the same visual um, cues. And so it, these, it's important to realize that these are indicators for a chemical reaction. To be sure that a chemical reaction is happening, you need to know that a new substance has been formed. All of these four indicators are getting at that there may be a new substance formed, but you have to make sure you know that you are getting a new substance, and then you know you have had a chemical reaction. So with these chemical reactions, what's essentially happening is you are starting with some things, so say methane and oxygen, and their bonds are being broken. So this is what separates it from being a chemical reaction, from a physical change is that you're actually breaking those intramolecular bonds. So whatever's holding those particles together is being broken apart. And then they're going to get reformed. So we can see these, um, this carbon over here ends up no longer with the hydrogens that it was. It is now with, let's say, these two oxygens here, and it has made carbon dioxide. And the other oxygens may have gone to form waters using these hydrogen atoms here. So all of the atoms are present. Um, all that is happening in a chemical reaction is you're taking the atoms and you're, you're breaking their bonds from what they used to be, the, the, the molecules, if they, if they are molecules, um, what was hold, holding them together gets broken apart, and then they get reassembled into these new particles. That's the new substances you see forming. That is a chemical reaction. So the law of conservation of mass um, is going to dictate what we end up with at the end of the reaction itself, we, we are not creating or destroying matter. So in a chemical reaction, you're just taking what you already had there in the beginning and you're rearranging it into a new way of being. You're creating new particles from the stuff you had before. You're not creating any new atoms, you're just rearranging them in a different way. And therefore, the total mass of the reactants and the total mass of, these, total mass of the reactants, total mass of the product have to be equal to each other. This is what we're gonna to use to do our balancing of chemical reactions. So we're not creating or destroying matter. You can do that in physics, not here. Um, we are just moving these atoms around and we're rearranging them in a new configuration. And that's how we get our new substances. So the reaction um, can be given to you in words. So you can sort of say it as a sentence and, and we could write this down as sort of a kind of mathematical sentence. And this is known as a word equation where you're stating what the things are in the reaction um, in words and what they become. So if you know your nomenclature, you can write the names of these things and you could write them out in this sort of mathematical equation. We separate the species on one side of the reaction with plus signs and we have the two halves of the reaction separated by this arrow or goes to form type arrow um, that separates the reactants from the products. The order of the reactants doesn't really matter. Same thing if there's more than one product, doesn't really matter. As long as you have the reactants on the left side, the products on the right hand side, you've got an equation. And if they're written with words, it is a word equation. A skeleton reaction basically is taking this word equation, sort of getting to a halfway useful type way of writing it, um, where we write the words out as their chemical formulas. So you apply your nomenclature skills and you turn those names into chemical formula. And then you end up with a chemical equation that is unbalanced, also known as a skeleton equation, which you can't leave it like that. It's, it's horrifying to look at. Um, and so you're going to want to balance this equation. That's what we're going to be working on. The 
terms that are in these equations. So in math, you may refer to these like this is a term. If you think of this as an equation, you have one side, and this is like an equal sign to this other side, right? Whatever's on the left is equal to what's on the right in just a different format once it's balanced. Um, but these terms in there, so like oxygen or a different color here, oxygen or hydrogen or water, those are the terms in the equation. They're often referred to as a species because they could be a molecule, but they might not be a molecule. They could be a formula unit. Maybe they're an ion or they're an atom or something like that. So there are all different types of things you can have in the equation, and we want to sound a lot smarter than saying the word thing, so we refer to them as species. So this, this species here is water, and this species over here is oxygen. So for the balanced chemical equation, we need to make sure that the type and the number of atoms on each side of the chemical equation stays exactly the same. We're not creating any atoms throughout the reaction. We're not destroying any atoms. They all have to be accounted for. Whatever you start with, you have to end with. So if you think of this visually, we are basically just rearranging those atoms. Another example here, we have two hydrogen molecules, and you can see that they get broken apart from each other. And we have a oxygen molecule, as you can see, it gets broken apart. And those two hydrogens end up attaching to one oxygen. And these things out front are telling us how many of each of those species there are. So just to clarify, the reactant, these are the things you have on the left-hand side of the equation. And, and later when you get to writing equations backwards or flipping them around, um, it's going to be defined as who, who the reactant is. It's just whoever's on the left-hand side of the equation. And therefore, whoever's on the right-hand side, that's the product. That's what's getting formed by the reaction. We also are able to include the states of the species. Um, if we know them, you should include them in there. Sometimes it is really important to include them. And so we write them as a subscript in brackets after the chemical formula. So if we have the chemical formula H2O, we could say, okay, well, this is a liquid. So we'd write it as a subscript behind it to say what state it was in. If we had oxygen as a gas, we could write O2. And then we'd say, okay, its state in this particular reaction is a gas. The subscripts that we see in the chemical formula, remember that they are what tells you how many atoms are of that particular element are there in that particular species. So again, for example, H2O is saying there are two hydrogens, and we don't write the one for the oxygen, uh, but there is one oxygen. Look, there it is, two hydrogens in this water molecule here. Coefficients are what we use to write our balanced chemical equations. So these are the numbers that show up in front of the species. And think of them as just being the number of those things, those species, that particular species that we happen to have. So when we write 3H2O, that's the same thing as saying H2O, 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 but we don't want to write it out three times. We don't. We could. We could say H2O plus H2O plus H2O, um, but all of that is the same thing as saying three H2Os, and that is a coefficient in the front there. So there are three of those water molecules. When we go to count atoms in the formula, we can look at how these subscripts, these coefficients, and the brackets that we see in the formula all come together. And let's go through and practice a couple of uh, counting of atoms within a formula. So here's a subscript, and again, remember, it only applies to what is directly in front of it. So here we have our two here. It is on the chloride of the magnesium chloride. So there is only one magnesium, and there are two chlorides. And I'm writing chlorine atoms here that we do know that these are actually ions, right? Um, and then this magnesium nitrate here, again, we see some brackets there. And so we know that the two outside the bracket applies to everything that is inside of the bracket. So it's like saying that we have one magnesium, and remember, this is an ion, um, and we actually have two of these nitrate ions, which means we have two nitrogen atoms in there, and we have three of which we have two groups of. So think of it as saying two groups of three of those oxygens. So we have six of those oxygens. When you have a coefficient in there as well, it will also act as a multiplier because not only do you have the atoms within the species, but then the coefficient tells you how many of those species you have. 
So if we have a 2 now in front of our magnesium chloride, we now have ions, um, two magnesium ions because each magnesium chloride has one of them. It's the same thing as saying MgCl2, MgCl2. And again, we don't want to have to write it out twice. That's why we use the two, the coefficient of two. Um, but if we did have these two here, we would have two magnesium ions. And in that case, each one has two chloride ions. So we'd have two chlor sorry, two groups of two, total of four chloride ions. Now, when we go to do our magnesium nitrate here, again, the three in front, that coefficient of three out front tells us how many of that species we have. So we would have three magnesium ions in this case again, um, but now we have three groups of two nitrate ions. So this again, it was already that we had two of them per magnesium. So we, we already had a, two of these nitrates. And now what we're saying is this coefficient is going to multiply that out by three. We have three groups of those two nitrates. So for our nitrogens, we now have three groups of two, six of them. And again, we, we had six in each group before of oxygens, which we're gonna multiply by three. So we're up to 18 of these oxygens in this magnesium nitrate. Now, these, these coefficients out front, they're going to be particular to the reaction itself. So once you get your balanced chemical equation, you'll find out what the coefficients are. And then, again, you got to be able to use that to count, and this is how you get the coefficient in the first place, to make sure that those atoms are equal on both sides. So, quick practice here. Um, based on this previously balanced chemical equation, we can look at the nitrogens, the hydrogens on the left, and the nitrogens, hydrogens on the right, and make sure that they're equal on both sides. And these coefficients have been put there to make sure that they are equal. So let's just work on counting them on this one. On the reactants, we have two nitrogens, and on the, the uh, three groups of two hydrogens, so that's a total of six hydrogens. On the product side, because of the two there, we have two nitrogens and two groups of three hydrogens. So Everything's balanced. We have a balanced chemical reaction. These are the correct coefficients. And if you'd like, you can write a coefficient of one, but again, we don't like writing ones in chemistry. So we can check to see if this equation is balanced. And again, on the left, we have two potassiums, we have two chlorines, and we have two groups of three oxygens, so six oxygens on the left. On the right, we have two potassiums and two chlorines, and there's my oxygens, six groups of oxygens. So again, those are the correct coefficients to get the equation to balance. You may sometimes have trouble finding out which coefficients are the right ones, but you will always know, as long as you can count, um, you will always know whether or not your equation is balanced. So rules for balancing, some things to, to follow along. And again, as long as you end up with the same atoms and the same number on the left-hand side as the right-hand side, it will be balanced. But some things to watch out for are that when you know the formula for the species, um, don't change it, right? The formula for, for carbon dioxide is CO2. You don't get to change that just to try to get your equation to balance. So once you have those formulas figured out, that is what they are. Do not manipulate the formulas, the subscripts, to try to get your equation to balance. Instead, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be adding coefficients, which mean, might mean as you change one, you change another, and you have to go back and change your coefficient in the first place. Um, make sure that they go in front of the entire species. When you go to put those coefficients in front, they go in front of everything. So if you have H2O, and let's say you wanted, I don't know, two oxygens so you could get it to balance, you can't put the coefficient in the middle there, right? It's got to go out front of the entire species. Its formula cannot be changed. The coefficient goes out front, um, and that too will apply to everything inside that formula. And again, just to say it to be clear, um, make sure that the atoms on the left are equal to the atoms on the right. That's the law of conservation of mass. We're not creating or destroying atoms, and so we have to make sure that they are equal. So one way to help with keeping track of these while you're getting started is to set up a little T-chart and track the atoms as you go through the balancing to make sure that they are equal on both sides. So you can say, okay, for hydrogen and for oxygen, I could tally them. And again, if, if tally marks work better for you, do that because then you can sort of easily adjust them without having to erase your numbers. Um, we can see that hydrogen and oxygen on the left 
R2 and 2. On the right, we've got two hydrogens, but we only have one oxygen there. So we're going to have to get this equation to balance, and so we're going to have to change. And again, we, we can't just put a, a 2 here and say, okay, now we've got two oxygens, right? The, the coefficient has to go out front. So if we put a 2 there, now that's great. Our oxygens are looking good. But realize what we've done to our hydrogens. We've doubled our hydrogens, which previously were balanced. So we're going to have to do the same thing on the left-hand side to maintain the fact that they're balanced. So we put a 2 there. We can count them up again. This gives us four hydrogens on the left. Oxygens on the left haven't changed at two. On the right, we have four hydrogens. And now this two, again, remember it applies to the hydrogen and it applies to the oxygen. So now we have our two oxygens and our equation is balanced. So um, if we're given a word equation, again, we can practice how we go from our word equation to our balanced chemical equation. So again, and then going through your nomenclature practice, magnesium with a charge of two plus, oxygen with a charge of two negative, we cross them over and rewrite them as subscripts, two and two, and then we reduce if possible, and we end up with our formula. Um, if we know the states, we should put those as well. So we know that magnesium is a metal, it's gonna be solid, unless it's mercury, which is not. Oxygen is gas at room temperature, and this is an ionic compound, so it must be solid as well. So there is our skeleton equation. Now, if we want to go to balance it, we've got to make sure that the number and type of each atom is the same on the left as it is on the right. So count up the atoms on the, each side. And again, feel free to set up a tally chart if you need to, but once you get going through these, you'll not need to write it down. One magnesium on the left, one on the right, two oxygens on the left, but only one on the right. So we're gonna to have to put a coefficient in front of that magnesium oxide. And there it is there. This would change our magnesiums to two oxygens as well. Um, and this would give us one magnesium on the left, two oxygens on the left, one magnesium, sorry, two magnesium on the right, two oxygens on the right. So the oxygens are looking good, um, but we've changed our magnesiums on the right to two. So we're gonna have to put a two to change our magnesiums on the left as two as well. And there we go. We have our balanced chemical equation. If by changing your coefficient, you cause that balance to come undone, so you, you sort of unbalance one by adding a coefficient, then you're gonna continually adjust as needed. So some things that can make it go a little bit faster are shortcuts. Um, if you have a polyatomic ion that doesn't get broken up in the reaction, you can sort of treat it as if it's one thing. So if you had, let's say, a nitrate on one side and a nitrate on the other, and obviously this would be part of something, let's say this is a potassium and this is a sodium. Um, actually, no, let's go, uh, let's go with a carbonate. Let's go with a calcium and a sodium carbonate. Um, and so if we have this polyatomic ion on both sides, um, you can, as long as it doesn't get broken up, treat it as if it's one thing. So instead of counting the three oxygens and the one carbon on the left and the three oxygens and the one carbon on the right, you can just say, there's one carbonate, there's one carbonate. Um, that balances, I'm good. As long as it doesn't break up, you can do that. Leave any elements until the end, it's always harder to balance the compounds because when you put a coefficient, it could change more than one thing with them. And so do the compounds first, elements till the end. And watch for odd versus even coefficients. Um, for example, if let's say I had this over here, also had, I don't know, sodium chloride, obviously this is not a complete reaction, um, but because I have a two right here as part of the formula, that's gonna give me a hint as to what is gonna go here. I don't know for sure what it's gonna end up at as a two, but it is definitely gonna to have to be an even number because no matter what I put in front of the sodium on the left, it will end up giving me an even number of sodiums. So and when I'm doing my trial and error, there's no sense in trying out odd numbers on the right-hand side. So that can save a little bit of time as well.